Canberra, capital of the Australian Commonwealth, stands the Australian National University, a university new in foundation and new in purpose. It has no undergraduates. The students here already have degrees. Their postgraduate studies will be further training, work under the guidance of the professors and research staff on projects related to original research, designed to add to the sum of human knowledge. The Commonwealth Government established the University by Act of Parliament in 1946. It now has four research schools. The John Curtin School of Medical Research, the Research School of Physical Sciences, the Research School of Pacific Studies, the Research School of Social Sciences. To direct the four schools, leaders in their subjects were chosen. From London came Professor Sir Keith Hancock, Australian-born historian, editor of the civil volumes of the official British war history, and a former professor in the universities of Adelaide, Birmingham, Oxford and London. The university was founded after the last war. The idea behind it was, well, let me put it this way. We're a small nation which produces a large number of creative people, uh, both in the sciences and the arts. But for the long time past, we've been sending very many of these people overseas and bringing in very few to take their place. No nation could stand such a heavy loss forever without becoming second rate. So Australia has taken steps to stop the loss. For a long time past, we've been exporting more physiologists, physicists, historians, than we have bringing, been bringing into the country. The best men in research, as in other things, go, they're bound to go, where they can do their best work. We hope that many of them will find the chance to do their best work in this university. The university, in its present state of development, contains four schools, each of which is devoted to research and postgraduate teaching. I'm director of the School of Social Sciences. Our work is both theoretical and practical. Uh, for example, the Department of Economics is much concerned with the theory of economic growth, but it's equally concerned with the growth of the Australian economy, past and present. Moreover, some of its members have rendered practical service to sister nations of the Commonwealth in Asia, to India, Malaya, Ceylon, which have difficult economic problems to cope with. Similarly, the Department of Demography is concerned with the theory of population growth, but it's equally concerned with filling the Australian continent, including all the fascinating problems that have arisen from the absorption of hundreds of thousands of immigrants since the war. Meanwhile, one member of the department has taken charge of the censuses of Fiji, New Guinea and other territories of the Pacific. The department is only four or five strong. In the other departments, political science, law, statistics and the rest, it's the same picture. A few people are doing a lot of work. Some of it theoretical, some of it practical. We've already done something and I hope we shall do more to make good the drain of creative ability uh, that I spoke about at the beginning. Well, I'll leave you now to see some of this work going on. You might like to start with the business records that we've collected. Business records look dry and dusty, but they tell a story that is often romantic, of the success, failure, and determination of the men who helped to build Australia. From the facts here, the university's research workers can build up a picture of the past to help in future development. The facts of the past are used in the present. 
at meetings to consider the wool industry, held regularly in the Social Sciences School, with Professor Sir Keith Hancock as chairman. A discussion on the industry in the 1800s is led by Dr. Alan Barnard of the university's economics department. And with him are Lawrence Fitzharding, reader in history, Noel Butlin, reader in economics, Dr. Robin Gollan, research fellow in history, and Richard Cornish of the Commonwealth Bureau of Agricultural Economics. The work of these men is adding to the knowledge we have of a most important Australian industry. And one test of the university's success is the contributions it makes to knowledge. These contributions are published in learned journals and books from presses throughout the world. The university's own publication section covers a wide range of subjects. Knowledge also travels by the spoken word. At a seminar in the university, scholars from Asia, New Zealand and Australia discuss Eastern and Western approaches to problems of philosophy. Chairman of the seminar is Alan Stout, Professor of Philosophy at the University of Sydney. The group includes Professor Pryor from Christchurch, Professor Das, Calcutta, and Dr. Krishna Daya, Sao Gore. The main purpose of the Australian National University is to allow concentration on research, the finding of facts and the development of theories. The Research School of Social Sciences has for its field the structure and working of human society. The John Curtin School of Medical Research investigates the structure and working of living bodies. When first established, parts of the school operated in places as distant as Oxford and Melbourne, but all its departments are now in Canberra. The first dean of the school, Professor Hugh Enor, an Australian, was a fellow of the Wellcome Foundation in 1946 and a research biochemist at the University of Oxford before joining the John Curtin School of Medical Research. The development of this school really took place because of two important considerations. These were the need for establishing a first-class centre of medical research in Australia and, equally important, the desirability of preventing what was rapidly becoming a one-way traffic of scientists from Australia to overseas countries. It was the interest of Sir Howard Florey that provided the initial stimulus to set up the John Curtin School of Medical Research within the Australian National University. Sir Howard Florey's recommendations were accepted by the government of the day and the first appointments were made in 1948. We have six departments in the John Curtin School of Medical Research. Biochemistry, my own department. Physiology under Sir John Eccles. Microbiology under Professor Fenner. Medical Chemistry under Professor Albert. Experimental Pathology under Professor Cortis. And Physical Biochemistry under Professor Ogston. These men and their research teams are working in very broad fields of medical research. But we are not associated in any way at the moment with hospitals or with clinical research or with sick patients. We believe that it is necessary to get a thorough understanding of the normal tissue before we can begin to understand what happens in abnormal conditions. But I could go on like this for quite a long time, and I really think it would be better for us to go out into the laboratories and see what's cooking. The Department of Medical Chemistry studies the action of chemical substances on cells. The function of the department is to work on the chemistry of such problems. The biological applications of the discoveries must be left to the biologists. So, frequently, problems are attacked together with men of other departments. Biochemists, bacteriologists, geneticists. Specialised research demands specialised equipment, most of it made in the school's own workshops.
Towering up 20 feet in the high laboratory is the metal and glass complication of a recycling still. Here are made rare chemicals, not available in Australia, that are needed for important experiments. The Department of Experimental Pathology is concerned with the causes and effects of diseases. At present, most research is concentrated on diseases of the heart and blood vessels. Rats are used for experiments in hypertension, high blood pressure. As it's hard to record a rat's blood pressure in any other way, a tube is fitted to his tail and the pressure read off electrically. The rats have the best medical care in the world. High blood pressure is a dangerous disease today and the experiments are designed to help find the cause of high blood pressure and suggest a way to control it. The Department of Microbiology concentrates on investigation of animal viruses, the tiny agents that cause diseases such as influenza and in rabbits, myxomatosis. The viruses are far too small to be seen, so their activity is studied in a suitable host. For the virus that causes myxomatosis, eggs are used. In charge of this research is Dr. Ian Marshall, graduate of the University of Melbourne and of the Australian National University. With the shell cut away, the virus is injected through the skin and the eggs go into an incubator. Three days later, they are taken out and a section of the egg is removed to be examined for signs of attack by the virus. From the observations made here, the effectiveness of the virus attack can be calculated. Although the virus itself cannot be seen, the results of its attack are visible under the microscope, the series of white swellings that are its marks on the membrane from the egg. The Department of Physiology is investigating the nervous system, the system that controls all movement in animals and man, so that the research is ultimately directed towards understanding all activity including the amazing performance of the human brain. Research scholars immerse sections of spinal cord in a liquid containing a drug and measure the drug's effect through impulses recorded on an oscilloscope. In the Department of Biochemistry, Dr. Raymond Blakely from the University of New Zealand is measuring the effects of vitamins on living tissue. The Warburg respirometer produces conditions of heat similar to that of the human body so that the tissue reacts as it would in a living man. University House is the centre for informal meetings within the university. It is the home of many of the students and staff and a club for members who live outside the university. Deputy Vice-Chancellor and Master of the House is a former Professor of Greek at the University of Sydney, Professor A.D. Trendle. Gratiam tuam domine in funde in has aides, et nobis sedalibusque nostris, benedic quaesimus hunc cibum in usum nostrum, nos ipsos in servitium tuum. Visitors from Australia and overseas are entertained at University House. Dr. Nicholas Pefsner is head of the Department of History of Art at Birkbeck College, London. Professor Careless comes from the University of Toronto. As they meet and talk in University House, scholars exchange information and views on different subjects, different schools, different countries. Dr. Edward Irving from Cambridge University is a fellow in the Department of Geophysics. Stanley Vining from the University of Kansas is in the Department of History. Annis from India, Department of Geography. In one of the University House flats, Igor Durakovitz from the University of Rome and his wife talk with Dr. and Mrs. Maidan from India. Medical research, Physical Sciences, Social Sciences, Pacific Studies. Four schools do not make a university. A university is something in itself. 
a body of people working on a common task, members of a group devoted to the search for knowledge. The university's research school of Pacific studies has been led by a number of scholars, including Professor James Davidson. Born in New Zealand, he came to the Australian National University from Cambridge, where he was a fellow of St. John's College. The Research School of Pacific Studies is concerned with building up knowledge and understanding of the countries which are Australia's neighbours in Asia and the Pacific. In the Pacific Islands, from Hawaii westwards to Fiji, in China and Japan, in Indonesia, Malaya and India. What has been the history of these countries? What are the basic ideas and values which lie behind their social and political life at the present day? How do they earn their living? What is their attitude to the great problems of world politics in our own times? These, and questions like them, indicate the general scope of our inquiries. Shortly, you will see something of the departments of the school, Pacific history, geography, anthropology and sociology, and Far Eastern history. We've been working also in the field of international relations, and recently it's been decided to set up a department of economics to concentrate on the problems of the economies of underdeveloped areas. But before going on to these particulars, there are one or two general points that I think I should make. I should like to emphasize the great diversity of our work. It ranges, for example, from China with its ancient civilization to the highland villages in New Guinea. But behind that diversity, there is a unity. All of us are concerned with understanding cultures very different from our own. And nearly all of us spend some part of our time working among the people that we are studying. We can't uh, do our work simply by studying uh, documents in Canberra. Now to come to my own department, the Department of Pacific History. We are concerned with the changes that have come about in the Pacific Islands and Southeast Asia since the arrival of the first Europeans. What have been the consequences of an event such as that shown in this engraving, the arrival of the first missionaries in Tahiti, or of this scene, which shows the company of a French man of war firing on the natives of Tongatapu? What has been the impact of Western civilization in a country like Samoa up to the present day, where the people still meet in traditional style, but as often as not spend their time discussing the financing of the local water supply or the latest item of world news? Professor Davidson's interest in Samoa first had practical expression in 1947. On behalf of the New Zealand government, he hoped with constitutional proposals which marked Western Samoa's first preparations for self-government. He is now advisor on the final stages, which will make Samoa the first colonial territory in the South Pacific to become fully self-governing. In New Guinea today are some of the most primitive social systems known. Research workers of the Department of Anthropology and Sociology are studying the area and in the National University, a group meets for discussion. Murray Groves, a graduate of the University of Melbourne, is making a detailed study of a New Guinea village. John Barnes is the university's professor of anthropology. Jeremy Beckett is a research scholar in anthropology who comes from the University of London. The university's research school of Pacific studies is the only center where there is a combined effort to deal with the Pacific in its varied aspects. Field workers spend a good deal of their time among the people they study. In the eastern highlands of New Guinea, Dr. Paula Brown, previously with the universities of Chicago and London, is studying the social organization of the Chimbu and their system of leadership. Administration, effective only a short time in this area, has already had an impact on the life of these people, and new kinds of leadership are emerging. In the same area, Dr. Harold Brookfield of the Department of Geography, who came from the University of London, is studying the system of land ownership and use among the Chimbu. (laughs) 
Results are recorded on rough sketch maps and translated onto finished maps in the Department of Geography at the Australian National University. Head of the department is Professor Oscar Spate from the University of Cambridge. His men are widely scattered in Samoa, the New Hebrides, Papua New Guinea, Sumatra, Northern Australia, the Atherton Tablelands, the Southern Tablelands, Kangaroo Island and Gippsland Lakes in Victoria. The pattern of the Gippsland Lakes is continually changing. Waves erode the shores. Silt builds up on the bed of the lakes. Working on an Australian National University scholarship, Eric Bird from the University of London is studying the physical geography of the lakes. By analysis of samples of sediment from the bottom of the lakes, it is possible to reconstruct the past vegetation and climate of the area. Studies of the processes of erosion and silting can be important in practical matters, such as erosion of pleasure beaches and silting of harbours. Water, a study for the scientists today, was a study for the Chinese artist in the past. The Department of Far Eastern History is headed by Professor Patrick Fitzgerald, a world authority on China where he lived for many years. Few people realize that the Chinese invented printing long before books were made in Europe. The Chinese typewriter has more than 4,000 characters, so hundreds have to be kept in boxes beside the typewriter. The Oriental Library in the university has more than 20,000 books, including books on how the machines of 17th century China were built. But it is a machine of today, a proton synchrotron, that is building in the laboratories and workshops of the Research School of Physical Sciences. Director of the school is Professor Sir Mark Oliphant, graduate of the Universities of Adelaide and Cambridge, formerly Assistant Director of the Cavendish Laboratory. The matter of which the universe is made consists of tiny submicroscopic particles. From these particles, the atoms are made, and from the atoms, the substances of which the world is composed are made. It is the aim of the physical sciences to try and understand the nature of these little particles, the kind of forces that act between them and hold them together, and the nature of the substances that they produce. At the one end of the scale, the astronomer uh, studies the large-scale aspects of this universe. Uh, on Mount Stromlo, Professor Bock and his assistants uh, study the southern sky, the space which can be observed from the southern hemisphere, that is to say. And uh, at the other end of the scale, Professor Titterton and I, he in the Department of Nuclear Physics and I in the Department of Particle Physics, study the properties of the nuclei of atoms and the way they're built up from the fundamental particles. In between these two extremes, uh, uh, Professor Lakuta is concerned with tying the observations together into a coherent whole and making it part of physics today. While Professor Jager in the Department of Geophysics studies the crust of the Earth and he and his assistants are concerned with the forces that produce mountains, with the uh, movement of the continents of the Earth, with movements of the poles of the Earth and with the flow of heat through the crust of the Earth. And lastly, we have a small department which concerns itself with what's called radiochemistry and its main task is to measure the ages of Australian rocks. In my own department, that of particle physics, we are constructing a large particle accelerator or atomic gun which is designed to produce particles with a speed approaching that of light. As a matter of fact, I have a model of it over here. This model shows in miniature what we're trying to do. In miniature, because this magnet in fact weighs about 2,000 tons. The fundamental particles that we use, called protons, are fired by means of this little cyclotron 
into the rising magnetic field produced by these great coils of wire in which a current of about 2,000 amperes rises continuously. Uh, this current is produced by this homopolar generator and with this equipment we hope to produce particles with an energy of about 10,000 million volts. The proton-synchrotron orbital magnet obtains its energy from a large homopolar electrical generator in which four 20-ton disks of steel revolve in the field of a large electromagnet at 900 revolutions per minute. Energy at a rate of over a million horsepower will be fed into the orbital magnet when the disks are stopped dead in about three quarters of a second. To stand these enormous strains, strength and precision are vital. Structures weighing hundreds of tons have to be built for the experiments that give information on the tiny particles. And, huge as the machines are, they have to be built to the finest degree of accuracy. The design and construction of the proton synchrotron is a task undertaken by the scientists and technicians of the university. Nuclear physics is the study of the materials from which our universe is made and the basis of the atomic energy industry which will give mankind a vitally needed new power source. One of the department's accelerators generates a million and a quarter volts to accelerate hydrogen and heavy hydrogen to speeds of 35 million miles per hour. The hydrogen and heavy hydrogen nuclei are used to bombard targets, often thin layers of a light metal. The projectiles fired by the accelerator cause disintegration of some atoms of the targets and the results of disintegration are observed. Of course you can't see the particles and they are detected by special devices, often electrically. Sometimes photographic emulsion is used to record charged particles that leave a track as they pass through the emulsion. After development, the tracks can be seen under the microscope as chains of grains. Technicians search the photographic plates for the tracks and record their size, position and so on. From the tiniest particles, the Department of Nuclear Physics, to the vastness of the universe, the Department of Astronomy, at Mount Stromlo, some 10 miles outside Canberra. Head of the department is Professor Bart J. Bock, born in Holland, a graduate of Leiden and Groningen, and a former Harvard professor. The 74-inch telescope is a fine place from where to start explaining Mount Stromlo Observatory. At Mount Stromlo, we are interested in three principal areas of research. The first one is the study of the Milky Way and of the Magellanic Clouds. We study the colors of the stars, we measure their brightnesses, we study their variability, we study their spectra. Our own Milky Way system is the one to which the Sun belongs. From the southern hemisphere we can beautifully view also the two companion systems, the star clouds of Magellan. Then there come the problems of studying the spectra of the stars, looking at stars under magnifying glasses and finding out just what is going on inside their atmospheres. The 74 inch here helps out on that. Third, we run the national time service. And when you hear the time pips coming through, in many cases they will originate from Mount Stromlo Observatory. Since we are a university observatory, we stress, of course, the training of graduate students. We have quite a few of them on the premises, and the future astronomers of Australia are made here. Now, when you want to see an observatory, you shouldn't stay there always in the daytime. You must come up at night. At night, the dome of the observatory swings open. The technician at the controls, with a flick of his finger, can move the 100-ton dome, or the 40-ton telescope, aligning it exactly with particular stars to be observed. Tonight, Arthur Hogg, Assistant Director of the Observatory and Doctor of Science of the University of Melbourne, is preparing to make observations of the star clouds of Magellan, a stellar system outside the Milky Way, 150,000 light years from the Earth. The secrets of the universe, the secrets of the atom, the past, the present. The advance of knowledge is the task of the Australian National University. The scientist, the historian, 
the geographer. All are part of a pattern of knowledge. The Australian National University is a new foundation. On the old traditions it inherits, it is building its own. Its work has only begun. The test of that work will be the contributions made to knowledge and the quality of the scholars who go to the research centres of the world from the Australian National University.